again, we would like to welcome Sedat Nizamul uh, coming here to give a, a seminar for us. Uh, as as you mentioned, he has graduated from Bilkan University, EE Physics EE, then he moved to Harvard Medical School, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, as a postdoc, then he joined Koch University. Uh, with lots of honors, uh, to be tak, uh, encouragement, Teshvik, uh, Cuba, and also uh, Believe Academy, uh, Bagia Awards. Uh, also, he was awarded uh, the ERC study grant. We are welcome, uh, we welcome uh, Sadat Nimazunizamo. I would like to initially thank you for the nice organization. I am very excited to be here. In fact, I didn't have a chance to be a graduate of Middle East Technical University, but it has an importance in my life. Uh, our neighbor in our apartment was from Middle East Technical University, and he has significant effect on me to become an electrical engineer and to study these I mean, topics. So that uh, Middle East Technical University has a kind of uh, great importance for me and I am very happy to right now be here and share our recent findings on how to communicate with neurons with non-living uh, devices, electrical, optoelectronic devices. Today I will discuss you these topics. And uh, the lab that right now I am the director is, it is called Innovative Devices and Interfaces Laboratory. And our research focus is quite broad and today I will more focus on the things that we are doing at the bio-nano or bio-neuro interfaces. And let me start with a very broad perspective on our body and nervous system and neurons. As you can see here, the neurons covers all of our part, all, all of the parts of our body. And this is, uh, as you can consider, are the electrical network of our body so that they receive the electrical signals or they receive the uh, other external stimuli convert to bioelectrical signals like for example pressure sensing here on my finger and then this information is transmitted through neurons, axons to the brain and then this kind of data is processed and understood as some pressure sensing uh, on our body and as you can see here uh, it connects us to the light with five main senses so that like touching, seeing, hearing and also memory, thinking, consciousness so that the neurons in fact affect all of our kind of daily activities significantly but the problem is if we start to have some problems that like paralysis, Parkinson, Alzheimer which we hear from newspapers and TVs as well they are right now the number one cause of disability adjusted life years so that they decrease the most the art quality of life and the, after the heart problems they are the number two uh, cause of death as well unfortunately so that to combat with these uh, diseases nervous system disorders uh, we propose to make uh, effective safe neural interfaces so that what does it mean let me give you one example of it for example there are some patients who are shaking their body unconsciously, like epilepsy. So that for that one, uh, what they are doing is they are using deep brain stimulators so that they can silence the biological or neurological parts, kind of to turn off the cells that, so that they can get rid of this kind of uh, disorders as well. So that if you consider that, uh, if we can activate the neurons and silence them, we can do many functions. Or if you consider a paralyzed patient, he or she cannot move his body. If we can stimulate the muscles there, then he may or she may start to move her body as well. Uh, so that the perspective is after several decades or after a century, maybe we, we may have like Robocop like prosthetic bodies as well, so that they can help us for different jobs, for the dangerous jobs as well. And to control the neural activity uh, and by using the light for it, is it light is an, in fact an excellent tool because uh, light you can focus it to a very small spot, less than one micron. It means that you can have very high spatial resolution. 
and also you can also control the light, you can make even femtosecond laser so that extremely short durations as well. So that this provides you an extremely high controlling ability on different uh, interactions. And recently, to control the neural activity with light, optogenetics became a very significant tool for it. And here, this is a cartoon showing how the optogenetics is working. And here, what we observed, this is a neural membrane. So that this is the membrane of a neuron. And this is a ion channel that we see here. And after the light is absorbed, then these channels can open. And then they can stimulate the neurons. But to make them light activatable, you need to genetically modify these cells. And right now, the problem with optogenetics is, because of this genetic modification, there are many ethics discussion. And currently, there is not any clinical approval yet by FDA or by European Union, so that you cannot find any therapeutic modality in the clinics because of the genetic modification. Uh, as an alternatively, what we are working in my lab is we are working on non-genetic, light-activated modulation of neural activity. So that, in another words, we are working on non-genetic optogenetics. And in fact, are we the first one working on kind of light-activated? control of the neural activity without genetics? No. There are retinal implants already in the literature <coughs> which absorb light energy then they convert to some electrical stimulation to control the neurons. And uh, these retinal implants, I will give you more information about these retinal implants later. Uh, they, the good thing is they are right now approved by the United States and European Union and even in Turkey we have one patient who wears these retinal implants, one blind patient who wears these implants as well. And it is a kind of a, a good technology to recover partially the vision for some blind patients. But the problem in this technology is they have cost this significantly high. And as you can see here, they cost even more than 100,000 euros. This makes a, a highly uh, high bottom. And the main reason is, as you can see here, it requires some camera systems and it requires some high-level electronics here that needs to be integrated there. And it also has some uh, power transmission circuitry. And finally, uh, in clean room, uh, some electrodes, electrode array needs to be also fabricated, which are implanted to the retina on the eye. So that this, if you consider this, all of them together makes these systems very complicated. Uh, alternatively, we are working on a new phenomenon. Uh, and much simpler one, and uh, we call it as the optoelectronic biointerfaces. And uh, the working principle basically is this: you can just consider these optoelectronic biointerfaces as the solar cells, okay, like solar panels. We are making just solar panels. You can basically consider, and they absorb the light, and then they absorb this absorbed energy turns into some electrical current to the cells, and we stimulate the neurons by using these kind of substrates. And these are made of, you can consider like organic LEDs, OLEDs, or organic photovoltaic devices. Right now OLEDs are in the market as well with LG. So that these kind of uh, organic or inorganic based uh, devices uh, can be uh, fabricated very cheaply, this is which is nice, and they are solution processable. So that by just having one spin coated and necessary solutions, you can uh, create your own device. And here you see a picture that uh, the, an ACM image uh, of a device that we fabricated. For example, it is made of an ITO and on top of it we coated with a zinc oxide layer and on top of it we replaced another uh, organic photoactive layer that can absorb the incoming light. So that it is, as you can see here, it is very simple to fabricate as well. And another good thing is it doesn't require any power supply. In general, most of the implants require some batteries to supply energy to them. And this is a, this is a like solar cell and passive device so that the incoming light in fact energizes these uh, interfaces. And scientifically what excites us is uh, we can do molecular level engineering. You can consider that we can change the molecules in the photoactive layer to make it better, or we can change the assembly of these, or even we can change the device structures as well, so that it gives us a very kind of wide uh, scientific also freedom to play with this kind of biointerfaces.
Then how does they work? Uh, this is a cartridge, as you see here, this is the device that we fabricated. And we characterize these devices by growing, by seeding cells on top of them. And this is an electrophysiology amplifier. You can basically consider that, okay, we have a probe, and this is the neuron here. And this probe goes onto the membrane, and then we then touch to this neural membrane and read the voltage level on this membrane. And uh, from that we can understand whether we excite the cell or whether we silence the cell. And this patch clamp, this, this is called uh, patch clamp uh, technique in, electro, in neuroscience, it is very frequently used. Uh, to read the uh, membrane voltages shows us the stimulation of the inhibition of the neural And then the uh, question is this. Uh, how can we stimulate, how can we communicate with a neuron? This is number one that I want to initially briefly give a background. Uh, if you look at a neuron, it is in fact a, looks like a kind of an elongated cell type, but the secret for electrical activity lies on its membrane. Uh, here we have some lipid white layers, which generates the capacitance around one microfarad per centimeter square, and there are some ion channels that generates the conductivity is the, introduces the conductivity of the membranes. And if you look at how these neuronal membrane works, uh, this is the inside of a cell on the right side, and this is outside of a cell. And in the right side, inside of a cell, as we can see here, the potassium concentration is much, much higher. <coughs> but if you look at outside of a cell, the sodium concentration is much higher. This imbalance of these, for example, this imbalance of these uh, concentrations uh, generate a potential and initially this is called as the uh, resting membrane potential so that it can be for ex around from minus 50 millivolt to minus 120 millivolt and uh, here in this cartoon for uh, the proof demonstration uh, it is right now considered as minus 70 millivolt so that the neuron is at rest so that it is not stimulated and after you start to give some electrical pulses to them as we can see here, then the potential starts to increase, okay? So, and after, if we give a much stronger stimulation here, then it generates a wave, and this is called as the action potential. So that, it is like that, if I touch my finger, if I can sense it, it means that my sensory neurons generate an action potential, and this information goes to my brain. So that, this stimuli, stimuli the neurological stimuli, is the very fundamental, uh, response of the nerves to transmit neurological uh, information. But there is also another kind of uh, neural stimulation way. Uh, I would like to also give you that uh, information, which is not very common. Uh, it is called as anoplate excitation. If you negatively bias the membrane voltage, okay? By the way, the membrane mold voltage means that the intracellular voltage minus the extracellular voltage, okay? So that if I make the intracellular minus extracellular voltage more negative, as we can see here, after some time it also generates an action potential, it can generate. And this comes from the uh, uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model, the parameters of it, and so that they can, by such a way, uh, it can be also stimulated and it is called as the anoplate excitation. And uh, since the membrane is made of some uh, lipid bilayers which has some capacitance and ion channels, uh, as we as we see here, so that this is the lipid bilayer, and we have this ion channel which makes some resistivity. So that electrically, as an electrical model, we have an uh, RC circuit, as we can see here. And what we are doing in our group is we are connecting a light-activated current source to this membrane to stimulate or to silence the neurons. Then, uh, another question, how the light is converted to electrical current by the optoelectronic biointerfaces? Because we know that we, in standard electrical circuits, every kind of, all the currents are passing through some electrical wires, and so the free electrons are there, but these free electrons are no more available in the biological system. Because if you look at your body, it is made of fluids, so that how does these currents can go in these water-based systems? And right now, if we discuss that one, the first 
the way is it is called as Faraday current, Faraday charge transfer. And in the Faraday charge transfer, uh, we have the electrode that we place to a nearby neuron. Then these electrons can directly jump, these charged, minus charged particles can directly jump to the electrolyte. And if you consider the movement of the negatively charged ions uh, inside these electrolyte, then it means that there is a current. And so that this is called as a Faraday current due to the redox reaction. But there are okay, uh, some, uh, there needs to be some uh, care needs to be taken because uh, this electron, it is called in uh, chemistry as redox reactions it can generate. And these redox reactions can change the pH, which may kill the cells as well. So that uh, one thing that needs to be careful is it needs to be at sufficiently low level that it will not kill the cells. Or the second one is they can be also reversible so that you can put the electron inside and you can take back as well. So that you can also generate currents by that way as well. And the second one, which is the most safe one, the most safest way to stimulate the neurons are it is called capacitive charge transfer. And in the capacitive charge transfer, the electrons you can also move to the surface or holes in semiconductors. Then these negatively charged particles attract these positive ions, and then with this movement of the ions, we can generate the currents. And if you look at this um, electrical model of it, the for Faraday uh, interfaces, it is called, it is represented as an uh, electrical impedance, and for the uh, capacitive currents, we can model it as a capacitor, so that to generate a capacitive current, what we need here is the uh, potential variation with respect to time, so that you can consider that while we turn on the light, we can generate a current, and while we turn off the light, then we can change the potential at the electrode, so that we can generate capacitive currents. And we use uh, these techniques uh, to generate by using these solar cells you can basically consider. And we generate Faraday and capacitive currents today which I will discuss to stimulate the neurons. And this can be used for retinal implants for the blind patients. And these uh, right now blindnesses due to retinal degeneration is uh, quite common so that there are more than 100 million people around the world. Uh, in 2020, and it is one of the uh, main focus of area in eye-related diseases as well. And how does this retinal degeneration happen? Uh, in our eye, we have our lens in front, and at the back we have the retina. You can consider as the photo detectors at the back. And this on the retina, we have this photoreceptor part, and these photoreceptors convert incoming light energy to bioelectrical currents to generate the vision in the brain. But the problem is in retinal degeneration, this part dies so that it is no more possible to convert light to electricity. What we propose to do is like in the other uh, retinal implants, instead of these natural photoreceptors, we would like to place our artificial photoreceptors which taste the light and then generate Faraday and capacitive currents to stimulate the neurons. And then the question is, okay, our system is very uh, simple. For example, it is made of some substrate and then some like PDAP-PSS or some other PTHT type, some photoactive uh, molecules. And it is so simple, the question, does it work? Can it restore the vision? The answer is yes. This is a uh, movie taken from a study in uh, publishing Nature uh, Materials in 2017. And uh, as we can see here, this is a healthy one, healthy red, and its uh, pupil can uh, close up to 90%. And this is an uh, eye of the red, uh, which has retinal degeneration, so that the pupil can only close itself up to 30%, so that the light sensitivity is significantly low. And but if you put, place this kind of simple implants to these kind of reds, as we can see here, the uh, pupil can close up to around 60%. So that this shows that this kind of simple implants can introduce uh, a, light, a light activation to recover the vision. Okay, what we are doing in our lab is we are using basically the nanomaterials. And uh, nanomaterials, 
uh, uh, in nanomaterial family we use colloidal quantum dots and the size of these quantum dots is around uh, from several nanometers up to 10 nanometers and by varying the size of these quantum dots let's say from 2 nanometer here here that we synthesized uh, of indium phosphide quantum dots if we increase them to around 4 or 5 nanometer then its energy levels uh, decreases because of this quantum confinement effect and so that it has an appearance of red addition. These are the photo under UV light. So that it shows that by changing the size of the material, we can uh, change the energy levels of the electrons, photogenerated electron and whole energy levels, which give us the freedom in the, the device design. And in addition to that, we can also engineer the surface. You can even conjugate some drugs on top of these quantum dots. And they have strong absorption below its uh, bank gap. They, are, they have high stability. They are right now in the market to collect TVs. And also one important also property is they have adjustable carrier localization. Meaning that, okay, if you look at a core material, this is, and we have another shell material. Uh, by changing this core shell material, you can tune the confinement of the electron and holes. And in type 1, we can make type 1 quantum dots so that the electron wave function and whole wave function can significantly overlap. So that this is a good kind of uh, system uh, to have high uh, emission efficiencies, if you would like to have. And there can be also some type 2 systems, so that it means that due to the energy levels, we can localize the electron to the shell. And if, you consider, if I take this electron out, then I can generate a photocurrent in the system. So that these type 2 quantum dots can be very useful for photovoltaic applications. And which we will use right now for neural interfaces. And, but the problem in the literature is all these quantum dots are based on cadmium or like uh, toxic heavy metals. And we search the literature and we propose that it is maybe possible to generate a biocompatible type 2 system, cadmium free type 2 system, made of indium phosphide core here. And then if we coat it with zinc oxide shell, uh, as shown in, <coughs> in the band, band they are energy band diagram, the electron can be localized in the shell and hole can be localized in the core as a type 2 system. We also check to grow these two materials on top of them each other. We also check the lattice mismatch as well. They are around 11%. We chose that for colloidal systems, it's an acceptable level so that we can synthesize zinc oxide shell, grow zinc oxide shell on top of the medium phosphide core. For the synthesis, initially we generated the new phosphide core. Then by uh, thermal decomposition of zinc acetate, we grow the zinc oxide shell on top of this indium phosphide core. After that, we did the structural analysis by XRB showing a cubic structure, a crystal structure for indium phosphide and zinc oxide hexagonal structure. And also we look at elemental analysis which shows us that we have indium phosphide zinc and oxide in the structure. Also with the help of Professor Klebayan and Savanji, we also take the high resolution TEM images of these nanomaterials and their size are around 2 to 3 nanometer. And we take also the, we look at also the uh, crystal plates by using this technique and it also showed us the existence of indium phosphate and zinc oxide plates as well. So that after we prove the nanomaterial, the quantum dot that we have, then we quantum mechanically simulated the response so that initially since we wrote indium phosphide core it has a type 1 structure but for indium phosphide zinc oxide as we can see here the electron wave function right now delocalizes so that uh, it means that if there is a delocalization of electron it means that its energy level will decrease so the electron and hole recombination wavelength should redshift it means so that we should observe in the Photoluminescent, so that initially the type 1 has an emission around 510 nanometer, and after we grow zinc oxide, the, because of the less, uh, because of the decrease of the energy level of the electron and hole, then we observe a redshift for indium phosphate zinc oxide core shell systems. And also, since right now electron and hole are separated themselves, it takes time, more time to find them, each other for recombination. And uh, we did also 
high resolved spectroscopy and uh, the combination lifetime as we can see here significantly increased for the core shell indium phosphate zinc oxide nanostructure. This shows that optically as well we have a indium phosphate zinc oxide core shell structure. After then we started the fabrication of the devices uh, on top of an ITO titanium dioxide uh, substrate then we did a, a chemical modification on the surface and attached these indium phosphate zinc oxide quantum dots and as we can see energy band diagram as well is uh, after the light is absorbed then we have excited electrons and holes and these excited electrons can move to the titanium dioxide and ITO which generates a photocurrent so that this photocurrent can be used to stimulate the nerves and after the fabrication we measured the photocurrent uh, by using this electrophysiology patch clamp amplifier and uh, on the surface we observe after the light is turned on we observe the current around 4 nanoamp uh, here the low around this nanoamp comes from because our tip is quite small several micrometer squares so that because of that small tip uh, we have around uh, several nanoamp photocurrents and after we turn off the light then it decreases uh, to its uh, original position and we also compare indium phosphate zinc oxide photocurrent with indium phosphate only core as well and it shows that indium phosphate zinc oxide with a shell as a type 2 material is better for the neural stimulation and photocurrent generation we tested their biocompatibility with uh, our collaboration with the genetics department at Koch and we observed that under dark and both light conditions and in several days they showed by compatibility in vitro and finally to test whether this device can stimulate the neurons or not we right now grow the cells on top of this photoactive substrate made of quantum dots, titanium dioxide and ITO and then we patch clamp as well, this is a patch that we generate, this is a neuron as, we, as, as you can see here and then we came on the membrane of the neuron and then we read the signal right now on the neuron and let's see what happens under light so that this red bar shows when, why we turn on the light and after we turn on the light the potential goes to negative due to the current direction and finally due to anopre excitation as we discussed, we see an action potential here. So that this shows that these devices can be used either silencing or depolarization of the neurons, or also they can be also generate uh, anoplate excitation uh, for uh, neural activation. And recently also we introduced another nanomaterial, it is called aluminum antimonide quantum lab. This material is very interesting because in bulk it is an indirect band gap material, but this is the first colloidal synthesis in the world. And after we make a nano size, for example, it ranges from uh, 4 or 5 nanometer to 9 nanometer, then they start to uh, emit quite bright light around 18 percent with 18 percent quantum yield. So that right now we don't know the physics why they emit so bright. This is an interesting open question to the literature. And right now I will switch to another topic. So far we discussed how uh, playing with these nanoparticles can be uh, effective to increase the current levels to stimulate the neurons. Right now I will discuss how the nano assembly to play with these quantum dot layers can be effective to increase the currents to stimulate the neurons. And for this study inspired from the nature uh, nature do very efficient the photosynthesis and in photosynthesis it absorbs the light and then the pigment sets some very high energy levels and these high energy pigments donate their energy to another pigment which is chlorophyll and then to another one chlorophyll and but what is quite interesting is the energy level as you can see goes from higher energy one to lower and much lower and finally it goes to the reaction centers and so that the photosynthesis process occurs finally at the end. And the nice thing about such an energy level gradient, it, it, this such an energy funnel makes the photosynthetic systems very efficient. And by using such an energy gradient, we applied uh, 
these energy gradients by using quantum dots, as we can see here, this is a smaller size quantum dot, which has a higher band gap, uh, that means in green. And then we uh, increase the size of the quantum dots so that they have a uh, slightly lower band gap and finally these red emitting quantum dots has the lowest band gap so that you can basically consider that after the light is absorbed then this energy or the exciton will transfer to the yellow one initially and to the red one finally and after the energy is located to the red quantum dots here then they will be accepted on the these holes will be accepted on these organic moieties here and it will generate a photocurrent to stimulate the neurons. And for that one, uh, we synthesize indium phosphide, zinc sulfide, Korshire quantum dots. And uh, for size variation, they range from 2.8 nanometer, this emits at green for example, and then we increase the size to 3.6 nanometer, they emit in red region. And uh, for effective energy transfer, the first rule is, if you look at this first time energy transfer efficiency, this is the equation for first time energy transfer efficiency. Uh, as we can see here initially, uh, we have the JDA factor, which shows that the emission of the dollar molecule, which is green emitting quantum dots, the emission, this is the spectrum, emission spectrum, needs to overlap with the absorption of the red emitting quantum dot. So that this is satisfied by such a system. And number two, uh, they also need to have some reasonable good quantum yields. This pi d is the quantum yield factor. So that if you have higher quantum yield, you have a higher first star radius. If you have a higher first star radius, you can donate much effectively to your nearby molecule these uh, absorbed energies. And for that one, in, on top of indium phosphide core, we grow a monolayer of zinc sulfide shell. As we can see here, the quantum yield increased significantly, so that this will uh, also enhance the energy transfer. And to test this phenomena, initially we uh, fabricated a control group that is monodispersed. And on top of also, uh, as the quantum funnel substrate, we initially have a, a green quantum dots, then yellow, and so that all transferred energies will go to the red emitting quantum dots. In principle, okay, these are red emitting quantum dots, you can basically consider five layers, but this is three layers, right? So that if I were to, for example, ask that what would be the emission which has stronger emission in terms of red, so that you would say that, oh, this has more red quantum dots, then it needs to emit better, right? In principle, you, you would expect that this control group should have a much stronger red emission. But if you look at the experiment, we see the inverse. And we observe that this is the right now control group, five layers of quantum dots. And this just has three layers of quantum dots, which is very interesting. And according to the literature, people say that there are some trapped energies. And by having this energy transfer phenomena, we can also collect, recycle these kind of trapped energies and to increase the signal levels by using uh, this uh, approach. And uh, on top of that, uh, we, all, we tested the photocurrent levels as well. Uh, and uh, we observed that for the quantum funnel, with the degraded energy levels, it showed a much stronger photocurrent level than only the monodispersed five layers of quantum dots as well. And uh, quite interesting thing in this system is this as well that I want to point out. This is the quantum funnel so that light is absorbed here. We have electron and holes and then the energy is transferred to the nearby new phosphide quantum mass and so also finally this to red emitting quantum mass. But if you look at this electron class hole is a effect neutral so that it is a neutral system that are moving here. Then the question is this, how can we generate a current from such a neutral energy transfer? And the answer is this, after these neutral electron and holes are moving to the red empty quantum dots, finally it is accepted by the organic molecule surrounded by these quantum dots, the surface molecule is 3 MPa, it accepts, this is a hole acceptor, this accepts the hole and this generates a photocurrent. 
And to test this phenomena, we introduce the time in the opposite here. So that what happens is this. Right now, electron is trapped here. And since electron is trapped in the titanium dioxide, the exciton, this electron and holes, cannot move to the indium phosphide. So that some portion of it are right now trapped so that the energy transfer is decreasing. And as we can see here, right now, in this photocurrent, so that this photocurrent, with respect to the quantum funnel, is decreased due to the electron trapping um, in this titanium dioxide coated structure. Okay, we also tested the biocompatibility of these systems and finally we patched and read the membrane potential and we also observed the neuromodulation by such a quantum funnel system. Uh, so that it shows that, uh, in summary, the uh, nano assembly can increase the currents that we stimulate the neurons, uh, which can be beneficial, for example, if, if, if you would like to communicate with neurons deep inside the brain, or if you would like to communicate at much lower light intensity levels. And finally, uh, in my uh, uh, final part of my talk right now, I will discuss with you how we can control the Faraday and capacitive currents by using these optoelectronic biointerfaces. And for that one, as the light absorbing region, uh, we used a bulk heterojunction polymeric mixture, which is a PTHD PCBM. These are very frequently used in solar cell research. Uh, you, those who are working in solar cell research uh, will know very well. And on top of it, we added some quantum dots, incorporated some lead sulfide quantum dots into it. Uh, and as we can see here, this PTHD, lead sulfide, and PCBM junction generates a quite beautiful junction because uh, we have an energy gradient here, number one, and number two, as we can see here, we can dissociate the uh, hole and electron in the system as well. So, and to understand the, to control the uh, Faraday and capacitive currents, we uh, right now tested three different structures. For the first one, uh, we initially we have a glass on IQ substrate. And then we have a in, we introduce an intermediate layer, and on top of it we have a, another photoactive layer. And for the type one system, for the type one device, we didn't introduce any intermediate layer here. So it means that we have a ITO, and on top of the ITO we have this polymeric mixture of the PTHD, P bed sulfide quantum dots, and PCBM. And here in the system, what we could expect is this: after the light is absorbed, then we have the electron here hole here, and this ele photogenerated electron can move to the water reduction center here that will generate, that can generate a Faraday current by this way. And by introducing a MOX layer, you can consider, then it will, uh, it, need, it generates a potential barrier which will block the electron flow so that in this type 2 system, we expect a decrease in the Faraday current. And for the type 3 system, after the light is absorbed, then electrons will be accumulated in the IQ region and holes will be accumulated on the P3HD and since these holes are quite heavy, they cannot jump to the uh, solution so that they will right now attract the ion so that we expect a capacitive, strong capacitive phenomena, strong capacitive current for the type 3 system. And this is for example a type 3 uh, device so that on top of the IQ we have the zinc oxide and we have the 80 nanometer uh, photoactive uh, blend uh, as well. And to test that, we applied uh, light pulses around 10 milliseconds and uh, in the blue region, a blue color. And uh, these are the results. So that in the initial one, we observed around tens of no 10 to 12 nanometer nanoampere of current for the type 1 system. And after we introduced this MOX layer, it decreased the photocurrent due to blocking of the electron as we expected so that it decreased less than one nanoamp right now. And for the third system, since the holes are here, they right now can attract the ions so that we expect a capacitive current. And uh, since capacitive currents depends on the interfacial potential change with respect to time, while we turn on the light, we see the initial spike. While we turn off the light, we see the second spike here so that this shows the future of a capacitive current, so that double spike in nature shows a capacitive current here 
so that right now we have a system, a, a photovoltaic or optoelectronic bio interface that are converted from high Faraday to a purely capacity one. So that and these capacity bio interfaces are the most safe way, safest way to stimulate the neurons. And we also electrochemically analyze them so that the impedance, uh, as we expected, increases for the capacity one, and the capacitance also the double capacitance also increases, showing that why we all why we observe the capacity currents by this type three system. Then the question is, what is the role of lead sulfide quantum dots in this bulk heterojunction mixture? And we investigated uh, this, and the, the main reason comes from the better nanomorphology, this is an atomic force microscope image. So that this is without quantum dots, this is with quantum dots, as we can see, a much better mixture of these, uh, and much smoother uh, quantum dots, we observe a much better exton dissociation uh, by such a bio interface. So we also tested the biocompatibility and finally we uh, then seeded cells on top of the capacity bio interface and uh, here this is the transmembrane voltage, uh, transmembrane potential of the neuron so that after we turn on the light we see the initial spike so that this comes the, from the capacitive current due to capacitive current and after we turn off the light we see another spike this is also the second uh, uh, variation of the uh, interfacial voltage so that these two spikes shows that we have capacitive membrane modulation by these bio interfaces which is safe and which is also efficient uh, this is also critical because we are operating less than one milliwatt per, we can operate less than one milliwatt per centimeter square. If you look at the literature, right now these are the most sensitive capacitive neurostimulators right now that we develop. Finally, to conclude, uh, we are right now today I discussed with you how we can communicate with neurons by using polymeric and colloidal nanomaterials and how to make some optoelectronic devices to stimulate these neurons by lab. Initially we discussed at uh, nanomaterial level that wave function engineering and at quantum level can be beneficial to increase these current levels and to stimulate them at lower light intensity levels. And also after that we inspired by photosynthetic processes we applied this idea to generate nano assemblies and by engineering these nano assemblies we can also increase the uh, Faraday current levels and finally by device engineering from a Faradayic neurostimulated we can obtain a capacity, pure capacity uh, photocurrent generator and this is uh, right now in our group this, uh, this part, these neural interfaces is the area right now that we are working more kind of uh, more focused uh, there are also some other uh, areas that we are also working like uh, lasers also, we are working on uh, solar energy harvesting as well by using luminescent solar concentrators. And also, we are fabricating LEDs as well. For example, this study in 2018, uh, by using quantum dots, we demonstrated the most efficient color conversion LED in the world. And it attracted significantly high attention by the news, rele news releases around the world as well. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank our collaborators, uh, our team members, and I would like to thank especially Human Shash and Rustam for the things that I explained today. Uh, I would like to thank all of our group members, uh, and also uh, we have also some positions uh, if uh, you are interested for collaboration or if you would like to uh, visit us, you are very welcome and thank you uh, for your attention.